Hello everyone, welcome back to Anatomy Weekly. I hope you have been following our series on the nervous system. Continuing with that, today we are going to discuss the topic of neuromuscular junctions and a condition known as myasthenia gravis. The word myasthenia gravis is derived from ancient Latin. Myasthenia means weakness and gravis means serious. Thus, myasthenia gravis literally means grave weakness of muscles. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder where there is formation of antibodies against acetylcholine receptors at the postsynaptic membranes of the neuromuscular junctions. These antibodies attack and destroy acetylcholine receptor which leads to the impaired signal transduction. This results in generalized muscle weakness and fatigability. Let us discuss a little bit about the neuromuscular junctions. In our previous videos, we have talked about the synapse in detail. Neuromuscular junction is a specialized synapse at the junction between an axon terminal of a nerve and a muscle. In neuromuscular junction, the electrical impulse in the nerve is converted to mechanical contractions in the muscle. Just like a synapse between nerves, the neuromuscular junction is composed of three parts. A presynaptic part formed by axon terminals of a distal motor nerve, a synaptic cleft, and a postsynaptic part formed by a motor end plate of a muscle. This postsynaptic part is anatomically different from a synapse between nerves. In neural synapse, the postsynaptic part is formed by another neuron. In a neuromuscular junctions, vesicles carrying acetylcholine as neurotransmitter is present in the axon terminals of the presynaptic membrane. When a nerve impulse reaches the axon terminals, the neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft in the neuromuscular junction is about 20 to 50 nanometer in size. It contains an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. This enzyme acts on the acetylcholine released into the synaptic cleft. Almost half of the acetylcholine is lost before it can reach the postsynaptic membrane. The remaining acetylcholine act on the acetylcholine receptors present in the postsynaptic membrane and initiates reactions that lead to contraction of the muscles. This mechanism is highlighted in our previous class on muscles. The postsynaptic membrane has numerous folds that increases the surface area for acetylcholine to act on. Every skeletal muscle has only one neuromuscular junction. The entire muscle is stimulated through this. Unlike synapse between nerves, the neuromuscular junction does not obey all or none law. This means that the strength of the muscle contraction is directly proportional to the strength of the nerve impulse that reaches the presynaptic membrane which was transmitted across the synaptic cleft by acetylcholine. Coming back to myasthenia gravis, in myasthenia gravis the immune system produces autoantibodies against the acetylcholine receptors which are present in the postsynaptic membranes of the neuromuscular junctions. This is usually the result of hyperplasia of the thymus or the growth of a thymic tumor called thymoma. These autoantibodies are mostly IgG and leads to damage of the neuromuscular junction by complement activation. Damage to the neuromuscular junction has been recognized to be threefold. First and foremost, it leads to the destruction of the acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic membranes. Secondly, there is a widening of the synaptic cleft. This implies that the acetylcholinesterase enzyme can act on more number of acetylcholine molecules and thus even less amount of acetylcholine can reach the postsynaptic membrane. Thirdly, the folds in the postsynaptic membrane are decreased. This leads to decrease in the surface area over which the acetylcholine molecules can act. All these factors lead to 
reduce transmission of the electrical impulse across the neuromuscular junctions. Stronger impulses fail to produce a strong muscle contraction in the muscles and this results in generalized weakness of the skeletal muscle contraction throughout the body. Now the prevalence of myasthenia gravis is about 1 to 7 per 10,000 population. Interestingly, the disease is more common in younger women and older men. In women, the peak incidence is at 20 to 30 years of age and in men, it is about 50 to 60 years of age. The female to male ratio of incidence is about 3 to 2. About 10% of myasthenia gravis occurs in children less than 10 years of age. Incidence is more common in patients with family history of autoimmune diseases. Symptoms of myasthenia gravis include a generalized painless weakness of all muscles of the body. The weakness is exacerbated by exertion. It worsens with repetitive activity and improves with rest. The more obvious manifestations are seen around the eye due to damage in the extraocular muscles. It leads to drooping of the eyelids, which is called ptosis, and asymmetry in movement of the two eyes leading to squint. The patient often complains of diplopia because of the asymmetric movement of the eyes while trying to focus on any object. The weakness of the muscles around the mouth and throat leads to dysphagia or difficulty in swallowing or dysarthria or difficulty in pronunciation. In severe cases, it might lead to dysphonia or difficulty in speaking altogether. Asymmetric contraction of the muscles of the face leads to a typical facies called myasthenic snarl. The weakness in neck extensors are more than the flexors leading to drop head syndrome. Weakness in the upper limb muscles appear earlier and is more severe than those of the lower limb muscles. The first symptom of myasthenia gravis is usually difficulty in lifting the arm over the head, resulting in difficulty in activities like combing the hair, scratching the back of the head, etc. In very severe cases, the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm is affected, leading to difficulty in breathing. Patients may also go on to need mechanical ventilation. For diagnosis, anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody radioimmunoassay can be done to detect myasthenia gravis. However, about 15% people with myasthenia gravis have negative radioimmunoassay. These people can be tested with anti-musk antibodies. Musk or muscle-specific kinase is a transmembrane protein which is critical for transmission of impulses in the neuromuscular junctions. Development of autoantibodies to the mask proteins can also precipitate symptoms of myasthenia gravis. Repetitive nerve stimulation, androphonium chloride test or tensilon test and single fiber electromyography are other tests for detection of myasthenia gravis. Androphonium is an inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase. Administration of androphonium increases the availability of acetylcholine for the postsynaptic membrane and thus improves the symptoms of myasthenia gravis. The treatment of myasthenia gravis is fourfold. The first is symptomatic treatment using acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. This suppresses the breakdown of acetylcholine. The most common acetylcholinesterase inhibitor is pyridostigmine. If pyridostigmine is not available, neostigmine can also be used. Excessive administration of the drug may lead to cholinergic crisis. This is an overstimulation at a neuromuscular junction due to excessive acetylcholine which happens as a result of the inactivity of the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. This is also called sludge syndrome, a combination of salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastrointestinal distress and emesis. Cholinergic crisis is treated by administration of atropine. The second mode of treatment includes ultra short term therapies like plasmapheresis and administration of immunoglobulins. Plasmapheresis literally washes off the anti acetylcholine receptor antibodies in the blood. The third modality of treatment is long term therapy of immunosuppressive drugs and corticosteroids like prednisolone.
The fourth modality is definitive treatment by surgical excision of the hyperplastic thymus or thymomas. It should be remembered that the management of myasthenia gravis may require one or more of these modules in combination. The stage of the disease, risk assessment of the different modalities, and the age and clinical status of the patient are all assessed to provide the best course of treatment. Folks, that's all we have for you today about myasthenia gravis and neuromuscular junctions. Stay tuned to Anatomy Weekly. Keep watching, keep learning. We'll see you next time. Thank you.